of their slaughtered husbands. These are the facts of life in Rhodesia today. The cities are not as dangerous as the rural areas, but are becoming more so. Terrorists blew up the oil storage facilities at Salisbury last December. General discouragement permeates Rhodesia after a decade of standing virtually alone. The English language press is controlled by Rothschild frontman Harry Oppenheimer of South Africa and has done much to undermine morale. Almost every family in Rhodesia has a relative or friend who has been killed or maimed in the war against terrorists who are financed by contributions from our National Council of Churches. Incidentally, the Salvation Army pulled out of the National Council of Churches, not wishing to be made murderers by proxy anymore. <laughs> After Encomo shot down the first of the Viscount airliners and the World Council of Churchills promptly gave him another $250,000 to keep on murdering people. Nearly 12,000 people are dead in this vicious war. Despite the fact that Rhodesian voters overwhelmingly supported the formula for creating a new black majority government, few have any illusions that it will work. Those who gave their approval by ballot simply saw no other alternative at this advanced stage, while others looked at it as a measure for buying a little time while they prepare to leave the country. Most realize that the formula will lead to political chaos, observing that it is based on the same political premise used by the British in decolonizing other black territories in Africa, the system of a one-chamber legislature with a black majority, and paper guarantees for whites has never lasted more than 15 months in any African country. And where it lasted that long, in Zambia, the conditions of delivery were far more advantageous than in Rhodesia, with plenty of money and no terrorists in the bush. After 15 months, of course, Kenneth Kowanda opted for a one-party state and held a referendum that was rubber-stamped by an ignorant black majority. Leaders of the white minority went to court, charging that their constitutionally guaranteed rights had been violated. When they won, Kowanda simply replaced all the judges and did what he pleased. In other words, white Rhodesians are putting their trust in the hands of the so-called black moderate leaders, Bishop Abel Muzorewa, Reverend Nbangi Satoli, and Senator Chief Jeremiah Chirao. Muzurewa is widely respected in the Western press, but the bishop's credentials are about the equivalent of my own standing as a minister in the Universal Life Church. There is no such thing as a bishop in the Methodist Church of Rhodesia or Europe. The title is honorary. Years ago, the African nationalists discovered that they could gain standing with the World Council of Churches by calling themselves reverend. There are literally thousands of men in the so-called black liberation movement who sport that title. Many of them have never opened a Bible, and a large number of them couldn't read it if they did. Bishop Muzurewa was a terrorist wanted for murder who was brought back into a leadership position by the Kissinger Agreement. A photograph of him has recently been run in almost every newspaper in southern Africa with a hand grenade in one hand and an AK-47 machine gun in the other. Muzurewa is favored to win the April 19th elections, but is not regarded as tough enough to hold on once the infighting begins. The Reverend Satoli, again the Reverend is honorary, was a terrorist leader who has been photographed in a Mao Zedong uniform being given the royal tour of Red China. Many of Satoli's lieutenants have also been to the People's Republic of China for training in guerrilla warfare. Keep in mind that Bishop Muzurewa and Reverend Satoli are the leaders of the moderates. Senator Chief Chirao has been backed by internal financial interests, which he is in turn double-crossed. He is the one who is ostensibly pro-Western and anti-communist, and he is in way over his head. 
Chirao, I am told, is an example of the Peter Principle in action. Then there are the avowed terrorists, Mugabe and Nkomo. And let me insert right here that Rhodesians violently object to these people being called guerrillas. Guerrillas, they note, are irregular soldiers who attack military targets only. In southern Africa, one is dealing exclusively with terrorists who only attack civilian targets. And the vast majority of their victims are defenseless blacks. Terrorist leader Robert Mugabe was educated in the mission schools where most black nationalists learn to hate whites, and he is a doctrinaire Marxist. According to Rhodesian sources, he commands 25,000 troops in Mozambique and another 8,000 terrorists within Rhodesia. Like the other black leaders we have mentioned, Mugabe is a member of the Mashona tribe. His rival is Joshua Nkomo. Nkomo, whose terrorists have now shot down two Viscount airliners loaded with civilian passengers, shares the leadership of the Patriotic Front with Mugabe. Nkomo is a Metabili, an offshoot of the warlike Zulus. Less a doctrinaire Marxist than Mugabe, and Como is a bloodthirsty thug who means to be dictator. He commands 12,000 troops in Zambia and an additional 2,000 terrorists inside Rhodesia. Under black rule, Rhodesia will return to tribal warfare. The Mashonas get along with the Metabilis like snakes with mongoose. The Mashonas have a four-to-one numerical advantage, but the Zulu-related Metabili are tougher and better fighters. Because of their numerical inferiority, almost all Menabili are now supporting Nkomo because they fear for their lives under a Mashona-dominated government. Mashona support is divided among Bishop Muzarewa, the Reverend Satoli, and Mugabe. When the European settlers first arrived at the turn of the century, the Mashona and Menabili were helping disease to keep the population down to about 300,000 by merrily butchering each other. The English established hospitals for the indigenous population and stopped the tribal slaughter. As a result, the population of the two tribes has today jumped from 300,000 to 6 million. When European control is ended, the clock will be turned back 80 years. Tribalism is alive and well in Africa. There is zero chance of both tribes peacefully ruling what will be called Zimbabwe with a permanent coalition. That is, unless the Soviets or Cubans replace the European Rhodesians and maintain order among the tribes. Rhodesia's whites are expressing their lack of confidence in the future by voting with their feet. When Kissinger shoved his plan for a black majority rule down Ian Smith's throat two years ago, there were 278,000 Europeans in Rhodesia. Now one-third have immigrated, and the escape is escalating. The official figures for last December cited 2,700 immigrations. Unofficially, 8,000 of Rhodesia's remaining 180,000 Europeans left during that one month. The discrepancy is explained by the fact that an immigrating family can only take $1,000 out of the country. But those going on vacation, or holiday as they call it over there, are allowed to take $400 per person with them. So many large families leave on holiday and never return. Imagine a family walking away from a lifetime of work at building a farm or a business and being glad to have escaped with only a thousand dollars. Worse off are the whites who are stuck in Rhodesia. A young man can start over no matter how much he is left behind, but the elderly cannot. And they stay on in the hope that they won't be evicted. They are dreaming. They will be slaughtered. The current bitter joke making the rounds of the country is that the definition of a patriotic Rhodesian is someone who can't afford to leave. What are the implications for South Africa when the People's Soviet Republic of Zimbabwe is created in a couple of years? A communist takeover over of Rhodesia will complete the saddle of red nations 
over the top of South Africa. In addition to Rhodesia, these will include Angola, Mozambique, Botswana, and Lesotho. Sparsely populated South Africa will have thousands of miles of border to deliver, pardon me, to defend, and the war will be on. American Baptists, Methodists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and other members of the National Council of Churches who have been financing the butchering of black and white Rhodesians while their simpering jellyfish ministers keep their mouths shut have a big surprise in store for themselves. While these moral eunuchs and wizards of weasel words think nothing of paying for the slaughtering of Africans, they are going to be singing a different refrain when as a result of what they have done, their own sons, and by that time probably daughters, will be sent into a no-win war in Africa a few years hence. When that happens, I personally intend to dispatch one of these sniveling cowards to a higher authority to explain his cowardice. The scenario is this. In about 1982, America will suffer a depression. Within a year or two, President Teddy Kennedy will be looking for a way out of the depression. As have his predecessors, he will turn to war in an attempt to solve the depression. Obviously, we can't go back to Southeast Asia. We've done that gig. South America would be too difficult for the Soviets to supply. There is very little room to fight a war in Europe besides the properties of a large number of multinational corporations would be destroyed. That leaves jungles of Africa as the most logical choice for a long, protracted, no-win war. Kennedy will go to South Africa and volunteer American lives to get the Soviets off their back after we put them there in the first place. Of course, Kennedy will explain, since half of the American military is black, they cannot be expected to fight for a racially segregated South Africa. The quid pro quo will be that South Africa will have to surrender to black majority rule in their country, where Europeans are outnumbered five to one. If the South Africans accept this offer, it will mean the end of civilization in that country, as is meant the termination of civilization in a dozen other African nations where people are now reduced to eating rats, snails, and monkeys to keep from starving to death. If South Africa accepts Kennedy's offer, American boys and girls will pay with their blood for the moral cowardice of their parents and their spineless ministers. Rhodesian blood will ironically be avenged by the spilling of American. Thank you very much.